Uh, well, that explains it, right? But DeSantis in Florida, he he's saying don't say <clears throat> gay. If that's legalized, that would be discriminating against some parents in the school system, right? Because a kid couldn't even identify mm -hmm. their own parent as being gay. We ready to go, Tom? You're recording? Yep. Ready to go. Ready to go. Um, <clears throat> tonight, our speaker is Charles Paydock. He's going to talk about nationalizing farming, food processing, and distribution, provide a real Thanksgiving for all. Uh, he's an avowed socialist, presents arguments for the government takeover of farming, food processing, and distribution for profit, and shutdown of harmful capitalist agribusiness operations. So it's all yours, Charles. Uh, can we get the screen share up? Oh, sure. I'll get that right here. Here we go. Screen share. There you go. You got it. Okay, I think we're all set, everyone. Everyone got it? Yep. Yeah, got it. All, all right. right, welcome. I think it's meeting number 5,598 or something like that. So the college complex is the playground for people who think. Okay, <laughs> uh, this is my uh, Thanksgiving lecture. Uh, I'm gonna cover four, four major areas. And it was a little hard difficult for me to organize this, but I tried to group subject matter together as best I could. But we're gonna cover four areas. The so first of all, general aspects of food. Uh, the second part, we'll take a little bit of a look at farming in the past and the present. Uh, and the third part, we're going to look at groups that are vitally affected by food policies, in particular people whose occupations are tied to the provision of food. So that's the third part. And the last part is uh, we're going to look at the current problems and I'm going to offer some solutions to those problems. So we've got a lot to cover. It's not a terribly long one, but I hope you should all find something very interesting in this. Okay. Uh, first of all, I love these uh, stock photos. I came across this one here. And unfortunately, there's guys like this across the nation mm -hmm. who have little concept of what's going on in the world, Nintendo. little interest in yep. finding out. <laughs> Need your time. Um, I, I mean, we're, yeah, probably both for drugs too. Uh, anyhow, uh, I I hope you get something here tonight. If you have a social gathering with your friends and family, that you will broach some of the topics uh, that I cover here tonight uh, to elevate the conversation. Anyhow, this is a question that I'm certain is going to be asked of me. So let's get it out of the way right away. But how much do we spend? Now, you don't have to read all of this. I got to, you can get these slides later. I'll make them available. Send me an email. I got a PDF I was trying to load. So if you want the PowerPoint, it will be available. Anyone who wants to copy. But people in the lower incomes, spend around 25 to 40 some percent of their annual income on food. Now, if you're wealthier people, that figure could be like maybe five to 10%. So food is a crucial issue depending on your income. The second part there, the average uh, expenditure per week for one person is about 79 bucks. And based on my own expenditures, uh, I'd have to say that's fairly accurate. I'm not quite that high. But the uh, on a monthly basis, it comes around somewhere between two and four hundred dollars per per month. Now, if you're on a fixed income, it could be an issue, I think. But uh, and one other little thing is that the market's largest segment 
is uh, confectionery uh, items, uh, it's basically snack foods. So uh, perhaps we need some self-discipline in that regard. Um, now, food production over time, of course, many of you are familiar with it. I've spoken on the life of the ordinary person. Uh, we began, of course, as hunter-gatherers and over time developed uh, sedimentary agricultural practices, uh, cultivation of food, in particular the grasses. Um, the thing we're going to be talking tonight is a fancy term. It isn't used too much, but I have come across it called intensification. So over time, regarding food, you see intensification. And believe me, this has, I believe, proven to be the case in the current time. Okay, now foraging for roughly, amazingly, for 90% of human history, uh, humans were foragers and they used simple technology to gather fish and hunt wild food resources. I come across figures that as much as 25% of the world's population still engages in some sort of foraging uh, activities uh, for their, to meet their nutritional needs. But uh, this is a long period of time that we, uh, that the earth is a plentiful source of food. As evidenced here by somebody assembled, these are all items that the ordinary forager is able to secure for their diet um, without any, if you wish, intensification activities. Uh, down below that, that's the standard diet of the uh, Native American Indians, uh, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, which no doubt they brought along and uh, to the, the first Thanksgiving dinner, the Wampanoags. Okay, uh, another thing regarding food in general is that it is relegated our, to about 14 animals, species. Um, there really are not a lot of animals that are bred, we call it animal husbandry, uh, for sustenance. Um, now, if you look in the plant kingdom, we've got a bit more uh, to choose from probably a hundred species of plants are edible. Uh, the list was grown, I didn't include it, but when the New World was discovered, uh, there was a bond, there's a thing called the Columbian Exchange, and the rest of the world was introduced to a multitude of foods which they had never seen before. Uh, the North and South American continents uh, were unique in that regard. Okay, um, the um, intensification of agriculture fostered, it, they went parallel development and you find villages came about, village life evolved and you still see that today in villages in Great Britain. Uh, and I lived in small towns uh, I live as many I live in a town that had 200 people only, but it we had the basic elements of a community. Uh, we celebrated holidays together, uh, and so, um, but it had an, an effect. Um, the securing food, um, you can see, uh, had. A, a means of affecting the societal structure uh, itself. That was the focus that brought about uh, communities. Um, okay, so you can see here, uh, the corn husking is a communal activity. Uh, we'll cover a little bit about corn later. Okay, now transitioning into uh, farming itself, Agriculture remained pretty much the same activity 
for centuries and centuries. There were some innovations made perhaps in the Middle Ages, rotation of crops. Uh, later on, you had some, I would call them land reform and closure acts, uh, development of the commons. The commoner, by the way, is someone who was authorized to graze their, their animals on the commons. That's where you get the term commoner. But there you see the really the thing that happened with the Industrial Revolution commencing in 1760 was machinery was applied to agricultural practices, uh, the full gamut of agricultural activities. Uh, there you see a, the first John Deere tractor, which are still made today in the state of Illinois, uh, the Waterloo boy. Actually, I want to point out one thing. If you see the red, the red uh, wheel there, uh, that's to put a belt on so you can operate all sorts of, I would call them appliances or instruments from hay balers to thrashers, uh, devices to bring your hay up to the loft, the labor saving devices. So that's what a very important feature of any of these tractors was that they could be parked and be a source of power. Uh, much like in, in industry, we saw in a previous talk I gave, we had cordless engines and things like that, steam power. These were internal combustion motor, um, mobile units. Uh, just to look at things here, uh, the advances such as uh, the development of the seed drill, uh, broadcasting of seeds. Uh, you could throw a whole bunch by your hand, or you could have a much more uniform approach. You can see the initial development, uh, a prototype there that was developed, the single row crop. And down below it, that's what you encounter today. Um, one of the things I might point out is I've loaded uh, tractors like that and the enormous cost of seed. We're talking, you're emptying bags and bags, and we're talking somewhere in a range of $10,000 plus. There's an enormous investment in this. It is not a, if I am by no means, uh, an economical activity in that regard, but to feed a, fill up a tractor like that uh, it required a significant investment of capital, okay? Um, later developments, okay, we're at the other end of the agricultural practices, the harvesting McCormick Works as well, uh, situated here in Illinois. I often walk past the former headquarters of the uh, McCormick Company um, in Chicago, which uh, changed radically um, the harvesting of crops. Otherwise, you got to use a scythe or a sickle. And believe you me, I own one, uh, both, and it is a really laborious activity. And I just can't envision how they harvested all day long, acre upon acre, using just hand, hand, hand tools, hand harvesting and bundling. Okay. Uh, it, I like to go to state fairs and agricultural shows on occasion. And this is what you see today. It seemingly amazes me um, how enormous these devices are. I've actually had difficulty photographing them to try to get the, uh, you can change the front ends there depending on what you're doing with to some extent. But that's simply incredible uh, that we come from single row crops. So I forget, I can't count how many are there. I think there's 22 or 24 I counted at one time. Uh, below that you see the, we saw originally the original tractor. This is the kind of tractors you're putting out today. I stood next to one to see, to measure it. And I did not come up to the top of the tires. 
Uh, these are incredible devices, uh, all-terrain vehicles. Um, and certainly uh, uh, testify to the increases in, in agriculture. There's some of the things you might see in the Great Plains. One of the things I like to remark is that guy in that tractor may have gotten in it at eight o'clock in the morning and he drives all day long in a straight line. And only then perhaps does he come to the end of the row and turn around. The size of acreage of the standard agriculture operation is grown over significantly over the years until we're talking about some pretty sizable pieces of real estate. But that's the scale, that's been the case for years. Some of the things about our public policy the year of homestead acts and things like that. At one time, a quarter section, they called it. You can get land in 90 or 100 an acre allotments was sufficient to support a family farm, which today is, would be regarded as gardening. Okay, I just happened to put this in because I watched a documentary on uh, harvesting cotton. And to show you the scale, of operations, I've encountered any number of individuals who recounted when they were younger or their parents harvested co cotton by hand, which is inconceivable today. Um, I've seen these operations personally and they're truly impressive. Uh, but that is what our cotton is, is, is done today um for transport to the uh, uh clothing industry all right now getting into thanksgiving uh i'm going to talk about three animal species or three varieties that form a good part or bulk of our diet and the first are poultry um to give you a little facts and figures about thanksgiving you can share with your friends and family, is that the average American eats 16 pounds of turkey. I eat a considerably more of that. I happen to enjoy it. I just had turkey last week at the college conference, as a matter of fact. Um, but around 50 million turkeys are concerned in the United States every Thanksgiving. It's with a combined weight of <laughs> 736 million pounds. Now there's a figure you want to keep that readily available in the application you are asked it. And there you can see uh, some of the uh, agri operations there, what happens. Uh, the chicken production, many of you are familiar with. There's all sorts of caging techniques, free range, uh, it's a difficult operation. One of our college regulars in Chicago uh, grew up on a chicken operation, a good friend of mine. Um, and this is uh, a unique operation. Uh, believe you me, it has, it is not all that easy to do. Um, all sorts of issues has been raised regarding the health aspects of it. Uh, and uh, the, of course, the conditions there, you can see uh, what, how they are delivered in shipment, which perhaps that little chick doesn't, they're even the little chicks are kind of a difficult to deal with. Um, there you can see inside a modern processing facility, uh, how a KFC gets their finger licking good chicken. Uh, that you can get in, put in a bucket. Uh, believe you me, these are messy operations and require enormous sanitation cleansing activities. Um, next are cattle. Uh, we're talking about dairy and beef cattle. Um, the, uh, of course, the dairy industry always has been of one in fluctuation. Uh, beef industry is largely settled 
focused in the West. All right? We're talking west of the Mississippi River. Um, there really is not that much presence here of beef cattle. You, you need grazing. Uh, a lot of people don't realize is that the grass in the United States goes from long, tall grass, let's say in Ohio, and starts to get thinner as you go west. So that in Ohio, let's say, uh, one acre will, will support is suitable to graze, let's say two or three or four uh, head of cattle. If you get out west, Colorado, what have you, it might require uh, five acres for one cow. Uh, up north, even and higher. Texas, you guys are in Texas. You probably know all about this, so maybe I don't need to tell you about raising cattle. Um, anyhow, the dairy industry always has been one constant state of flux. They came up a few years ago with so, something called uh, BGH, bovine growth hormone, which for some reason caused the cows to uh, produce milk in an incredible quantity, which made the herds unnecessary. Uh, there were concerns that uh, there were it was not healthy, but that's never been shown to be the case. And that's why you don't see any labeling in Praga's bovine growth hormone. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, by the way, uh, raising cattle, um, raising poultry and other animals is not an efficient use of grain or silage, silage perhaps. But um, yeah, it's the standard figure that it takes 16 pounds of grain to get one pound of meat. So it is a very inefficient means of achieving nutrition. Um, and you might explain why it is a pricey item in our supermarkets. Uh, regarding pigs, there are uh, one million, one billion pigs butcher throughout the world each year, 100 million of them in the United States, most of them in the Midwest. Uh, there is some presence um, elsewhere we'll cover, but there, there's different methods of raising, of course. Uh, they call it closed cycle, which is suddenly another term for like a vertical operation. Uh, there's a horizontal, ones where the ship to change around. Uh, oddly enough, sometimes the person owning the pigs does not own the, the buildings, the infrastructure. So there's different economic arrangements. They, someone may own the animals and somebody else may own the operation in which they are kept and maintained. So that's one way that actually I think that's at a disadvantage to the person owning the infrastructure because they have to invest in it. It takes about, I could stand corrected, it takes about 16 weeks in gestation of a pig. And as it says there, um, about seven months. Uh, so we're talking almost a year uh, for to get that little piggy to market. Um, I was the nation's top pork producer, but 24 million <laughs> hogs. North Carolina has, um, for some reason, been the focus of these, these uh, swine operations. And they have 2,000 massive industrial pig farms. Uh, the rest of it's focused all in the Midwest. Actually, I'm amazed as I travel throughout the state of Illinois, I see in any number of pig operations and I cannot recollect seeing anyone raising cattle. Um, now the problem of course, is that problem it's in one sense and in the other sense it's good is that the pigs produce uh, 10,000 gallons of waste per day in which you have to keep in ponds, 
which could be unpleasant uh, places to live by uh, altogether, needless to say. Now, there are changing into the groups now. We have a vested interest. Uh, we're vitally affected by uh, agricultural pol policies uh, are the animal rights movement, to which I have been loosely affiliated over the years. Um, there's a group here in Chicago called Mercy for Animals. They've been to the college complexes a number of times. Um, and uh, their initial thing was for Free Fridays, of course, but now it, it is regarding agriculture practices. You can see there one of the, some of their protest activities and in one down below there, they're uh, disposing of milk uh, uh, because they do not believe um, the, the cows are treated humanely. Um, the other thing is in Chicago itself, there is a movement to make it slaughter free, they call it. This is showing up in cities around the country. Uh, they advance a plant-based food system and they engage in direct action. What they're marching on there is they, they maintain that uh, animal husbandry results in a dangerous zootonic uh, a pandemic. It fosters pandemic, the spread of it. And there is some validity to that, um, but that's another topic. Another group, we've had them at the college in Chicago. Uh, there are tomato pickers from Florida and of course the farm workers of america um you can see um down below the strawberries i was involved in the strawberry campaign but now we'll see i have a question here the young man asked all of you how many buckets must be filled by a, this farm worker in a day to earn minimum wage anybody want to take a guess Um, you don't know. All right, I'll help you guys out. To make minimum wage, you have to fill 153 of those buckets. Uh, needless to say, that's why they have concern. Of course, another uh, population affected um, by food policies are the those engaged in the fast food industry. Um, I was reading that 26 million employees were affected by changes in the minimal wage legislation. 26 million, which that's an incredible number of people. Well, not all, they're not all on fast food. That granted that takes in retail as well. But we're talking about a significant number of individuals. Um, they're always threatening them with robotics or automation. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Of course, and the group that's been around for a number of years, I must say these are the most disorganized group I've ever been affiliated with, but I still like them a great deal. Uh, the fight for 15, they recently began uh, for retail clerks around Christmas shopping season. Um, Wendy's has not gone along with their suppliers. I've written Wendy's and put together ads for posting on social media. Uh, so uh, as far as I know, Wendy's, has, this struggle has been going on far too long. Another group, I get their emails, they're the UFCW, um, grocery store employees, essentially. Commercial food and workers, you know, they got a million point three members. As far as I know, they're a pretty good union. Um, anyhow, uh, another thing uh, that was they put out in conjunction with the Thanksgiving holiday is this list of a uh, union made. They, the list is longer, includes others other items that would make it its way on your table. You can look it up. I hope that when you go to Thanksgiving dinner, that you not you don't eat scab food, <laughs> but union-made products, not scab 
I'd say, let's just scab dinner. No scab, no thank you. Um, anyhow, there's been some other disruptions in the food processing industry. Most recently, this campaign actually concluded not too long ago. Uh, the guys who make cookies and crackers in the old days called biscuits uh, went on a nationwide strike. Uh, and I helped put together the postings on social media. I thought this one came out pretty good. Uh, for boycott, uh, the company Nabisco caved in right away. They, they they didn't want to, they really didn't like their brand being tossed around. So uh, this campaign is a win. Score one for us. Here you can see people were putting things up in grocery stores. No, go away. Don't buy any Oreos. So that was very effective in bringing in people who would print out things and post them at points of purchase. Another group you might want to look at, uh, that's what I mean, that keeps involved in, in food policies is Feeding America, of course, it, which focuses entirely on the issue of nutritional de needs. And you can see one in seven people they estimate is facing some difficulties uh, with it. And, um, they have provided millions of meals. Now here you can take a look. How does Texas rank in the prevalence of hunger? You guys are about right in the middle. So you got some work to do. Illinois is 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 real good. We're we're the, we're right where we should be. So come on, Texas. After this thing, I hope you're going to do something to change that. Um, another aspect uh, of, that we're talking about using growing for food, it always dismays me that we're growing, we're using our land um, for petroleum purposes. 25% um, of US crop lands. Uh, are used for ethanol production. No, that that that's I think that's that's ridiculous to burn up things like that. Food for crop land is is very valuable. Good crop land should be used to sustain uh, in people. Um, you know, actually, I should have mentioned with tractors. The real benefit of a tractor is that you didn't have to grow food for horses and you could grow more food for people. And you also could make some money doing it. But I think this ethanol thing is a mistake um, in that regard. Now, they're actually one of the things, corn, modern corn, look at there. I just want to point out that little, looks like grass-like thing. That's how corn originated. And there was no scientific efforts, but corn was grown by farmers around the world, season after season. And that's how you ended up with the cobs that we have today. Now, granted today, modern uh, agricultural companies have come in to, to improve uh, the types of corn there is. Um, the, uh, but it, over the centuries, Corn came from that little uh, grass-like uh, item on the right to the cab you see on the left. Now, when I was I lived on one farm, the farmer would get real quiet, and he claimed that if you were listening very carefully, you could hear his corn growing, the kernels coming out, popping out. Uh, anyhow. Another little uh, bit of trivia there. Until uh, really World War II, uh, corn was picked largely by hand. The mechanization isn't that isn't isn't that old. Another topic, related topic. Oh, I wanted to also add. Well, this is somewhat related. Amazingly enough, as much corn as has been grown and cultivated over the centuries. Um, 
there's a figure that the yield of corn per acre, amazingly enough, increases two bushels per acre on average every year. So progress is still being made is by no means a stagnant industry. Now, GMOs, I've looked into this topic rather carefully. There's no demonstrable harmful effects of GMO uh, Bruce produce. Uh, I don't know if anybody really wants square tomatoes. I guess they're easier to ship or purple strawberries. Actually, strawberries are potentially not a very good food because they absorb herbicides and pesticides to all them little dots. Um, but anyhow, I've not come across anyone who can demonstrate. I've been following this for years. They call them Franken food, like Frankenstein, but I, I have yet to uncover any harmful effects of GMO clothes. Now you got more railroad guys. I wanted to ask you guys, have you ever seen any of this produce coming through on a train? I came across, I like these photos, but there you go. I was wondering if you ever saw them come on the UP <laughs> or Tony. Well, they think I've been affiliated with the United Nations group. Uh, food is the core of their sustainable development goals. This has been going on for many, many years. They were trying to have a goal of ensuring that everyone, at least all children, got like a cup two cups of food uh, of some type uh, to eat today, every day. Actually, one of the things they developed that as a product, oddly enough, that they found very, very useful in meeting the ne nutritional needs of underdeveloped countries, actually is a form, a variety of peanut butter. And it's, it's, it's been uh, adapted as a, very, a foodstuff um, in these situations where there are crisis situations of nutrition. But yes, they're using peanut butter. Uh, another aspect of food production, I haven't heard too much about this lately. There were concerns in chocolate and candy industry. We saw the enormous amount spent on them, uh, but they were using child labor. I'll give a lecture on this. Uh, they used the children, sometimes kidnap them or parents sell their children um, into captivity and they are made to harvest cocoa beans in West Africa. But I haven't heard too much regarding that situation recently. Now getting back to the United States farming situation, of course, we're all aware of the Dust Bowl situation and the devastating effects it had across the central part of the United States. A lot of people don't realize about the Dust Bowl is that part of the United States is normally dry and dusty. What happened was they had a period of years that were wet. I think it was as many as 10 years. That is not the normal climate of that area. The climate reverted back to its dry conditions. And that's what happened. It was not like some dryness descended on, on, on the fields. It simply reverted back to the climate that it originally had. Okay, next one, I'll hurry along here. There's always been a dichotomy uh, between agriculture has never been um, a road to the riches uh, I don't think the guy on the left could could spend a day at hard work on any farm, uh, but we seem to be mixed up in our society and reward people for indolent activities, whereas the guy on the right is really doing a service to the community as generally lives in poverty. We don't know how to compensate our farmers. The other issue, of course, a crisis situation is um, the uh, depression, which had 25% or more unemployment uh, and food 
was a real serious issue. This does occur from time to time in the United States, food insecurity. Uh, I came across this. I'm not, this, there's an article regarding this um, in the New York thing. Um, farmers were complaining that the government is putting them out of business. I must say, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think, but farmers always seem to say that. And they said so to this reporter. Um, however, they usually blame, they, I've never met a farmer who was making money, by the way, which may be the case. They may be honest. Um, I don't know if I would blame the government. As a matter of fact, the US government policy has been anything but in favorable. Going back to the New Deal, uh, favorable, tried to be favorable and treated fairly, the farmers of the United States. I, I don't concur necessarily like that. If you want to buy a farm, by the way, after seeing this lecture, you can get out there next Tuesday and get yourself a, a plot of land formerly owned by the Penning family. There, you see below their prediction. I don't know if this is necessarily accurate or not, but within the next few months, apparently the United States is projected to import more agriculture products than it exports for the first time in history. That is incredible. We'll see partially the reasons why. We're almost through this stuff. There's a lot of economics here. Uh, this is why I say the government is in fact working to help the farmers. They're right now, this is October 18th. They, they're offering 1 billion. So there is a crisis situation, unquestionably, that needs to be addressed. I don't know if throwing money at this is necessarily a solution because you just sort of, there, it doesn't change anything really, the arrangements. But it's affecting now 36,000 farmers is a lot. Altogether, I think if you counted everybody, there may be 2 million farmers. You got 100 USDAs, got to bail out about another 100,000. 100, and during the pandemic, about 7,000 had economic uh, problems. Um, now, in other countries, they had, we'll take a look at some other agricultural policies. They produce tractors not like we did for sale at profit, but for use in food production. You can see here what is done on a communal activity. Um, for some reason, tractor driving is, has always been determined to be a suitable activity for women. I've come across that any number of times. We'll see some later. Uh, there you can see the, the counterpart. You saw the Waterloo boy. This is the first Russian tractor that subsequent to the revolution, uh, if you read at the bottom, um, in 1917, there were only 165 tractors uh, in the Soviet Union. And at the conclude 25 years later, they uh, led the world um, in that regard. So that's certainly an achievement worth noting. Uh, the other things they did, regarding their agricultural operations was to maintain tractor stations um, so that the repairs were done collectively by skilled personnel. Makes good sense to repair the equipment. There are some of the things, and I believe this is accurate indications of the success that they were achieving. Um, I, I think they were they were living in near slave-like conditions. And from what I understand, the peasants came with the land. If you bought a piece of land, you also own the peasants who lived and worked on that land, which is an incredible situation uh, there. Okay, other things that Chairman Mao is often criticized for his collective enterprises regarding agriculture. I don't know if that is necessarily the case. Um, from what I've read, the chairman also had always had a very high regard 
for the peasants of China. He even would do the long march uh, prior to World War II, such as if they took any food from peasants, his army would pay them for it. They did not simply take it, although they could have. And he had a very high regard and given a high regard by the peasants as well. Now they did have some discomforts. I'll use that term or you can choose whatever one you want. I don't believe that was the intention. Um, okay, uh, another thing is you have land reform situations. We have two examples of it and there are recriminations for those who took advantage of, of property rights uh, to exploit other people and they were put in trial sometimes communally. Uh, that. Another thing I, you can watch, you can find these on YouTube. Uh, this is an excellent series. They recreate what happened. And now England had, was produced only le less, the, they only produced about one third of the food necessary for the population. However, they were blockaded, meaning they were two thirds short of sustaining the population. And the government literally took over the farming operations across the country. Now I'll just say there's an interesting series, fascinating what was done. They would rank farms A, B, and C. If you were not doing well, they could take the entire operation uh, away from you. I don't know the details of that, but the farmers were conscripted um, and given they had county agents, visited them and monitored the activities. And they actually, actually one of the things amazingly enough, England never, never had rations for things like bread, other things, perhaps sugar, bacon, what have you. But bread was always in ready supply, unlike in other countries in Europe, particular uh, the Soviet Union during the war and in Germany. Uh, I just have come across this now and then. I never really knew too much about this, but and this is in the United States as well. There was a woman's land army. Since the men were all fighting the war, the women was, took over the, the farming operations. Uh, and there you see them. I say I couldn't even know what the term they called them a woman's lander. I didn't know what that meant at first. Uh, now we're almost done. This was the only slide that's got some detail you got to read. But how is free market capitalism is taking over? <laughs> they only want farmers to plant chemical uh, and machinery monocrops. Um, the, the largest food retailers, they're getting into the livestock and dairy markets. Their expansion, they are in fact taking over our food supply while we're sitting here. Um, they are cutting out the farmers altogether. You saw that farm, the photo of that farm. The top four companies control 85% of the beef market, 85% of the corn seed, and 90% of the grain trade. There is enormous concentration in the corporate farm taking over our very basis of our food supply. And something should be done about that. There's the mother, there's the only other one with some detail. The far, corporate farming has <coughs> over and over demonstrated devastating environmental impacts by its central Hello. use is pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers. Um, four companies control 70% of the agrochemical market. So they're a, when the whoever pays the piper names the tune. Now with climate land change, they're buying up arable land around the world. So we're talking about a whole operation here. 
if you're wondering what arable land is, there you can see it. The green is the arable land of the United States. A lot more could be. Uh, it's not been surveyed on foot and 50% of the world. However, they're banking on, on getting it. Most of the really, really, really great farmland, of course. Now, the pioneers, of course, thought any land that grew trees, uh, that was the ones that could were good for agriculture. But land that is void of trees is equally suitable, depending on the situation. Uh, now, another thing I'm recommending we do, and the railroad men will know this, we should undertake what was done with the railroad industry. The rail, you don't have to read all this, but the railroads uh, were bankrupt. And the government took, was it seven or nine, and put them together into one corporation called Conrail. And 10 years later, they turned it into a profitable operation. So just like we saw farms are in bankruptcy, perhaps if they took over the farming operations, if you wish to use the term collective, they could transform them within 10 years so that they do not need subsidies in order to maintain operations and to, for, to keep from foreclosure actions being taken. Another thing about agribusiness, this is talked a lot about the green communities these days. Um, they call it regenerative methods of growing food. All kinds of exciting methods of this. Uh, some of it works, some of it don't. Some has been around for a long, long time. Um, some require specialized equipment, such as no-till, um, where you don't plow up the soil in a traditional fashion. Keep, keep the soil from eroding in that regard. So this is a hot topic right now regenerative. Uh, now, there's some of this is the intention. This also follows in with the Green New Deal. Um, there's the Green Network that I belong to, and we're advocating what is called a shared, a, sol a solidarity economy. A solidarity economy. And then we're almost done. Another aspect, I didn't know where to put this, but food, food, um, the SNAP program, otherwise known as food stamps. Um, I'll read this for you. Trump wanted to propose, and this was late in his administration, massive cuts, massive cuts in the program. And it came up with some notion that he would supply packages of food of American made goods instead. Um, the Biden administration uh, increased the benefits, this is quite recently, by 25%, just the opposite, uh, which was the largest increase in the history of the food stamp program. Thank you, Joe. Uh, most of the recipients are children uh, and working families. We're almost at the end, I'm not gonna read this, because we've got to get going, but I always send this out every Thanksgiving. A regional poet from Indiana, James Whitcomb Riley, who wrote the poem, When the Frost is on the Pumpkin, and the Fodder's in the Shack, and you hear the kick and gabble of the strutting turkey cock. And then, yeah, all right, let's go on, but you can look at the poem. It's a very delightful poem. <laughs> poem of regionalism, which I enjoy sending out every year in a Christmas message. If you go to YouTube, you can find it recited by various individuals. And that's it. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you've gotten something to discuss with your family and friends next Thursday. And have a happy and bountiful year coming up. Thank you.
Okay, who who wants to ask the first question of Charlie? Charlie, Tony okay, well, Charlie, I, 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 I'll ask you a question then. Um, well, well, um, why, why, what we're seeing is an ever, ever increasing concentration of, of uh, business endeavors. You know, where were all these antitrust laws? Well, why aren't they being applied? And has this got worse still under Biden or, or Obama? So, you know, who has been asleep at the wheel here to allow this to go on? Because what we've seen in the last um, six months or so, huge increases in food prices. And, and you, you, what you've just pre presented is um, this, um, basically we have more and more oligopolies everywhere. And that's one of the reasons why we have these huge prices going on. So where is uh, where is antitrust now? Why aren't why aren't the various governments um, doing something? Number one, oh. Charles Paddock knows nothing about antitrust legislation or its laws, so I'm not qualified to answer that. You are eminently more qualified, sir, to let us know <laughs> what that situation is. And I invite you. And secondly, the solution I offer is to prop up the farm, farm farmers as a legitimate competitor to those big four. And they can present a challenge. And collectively pose a challenge to them. Right now they own the entire market. However, if somebody shows up who's I've got equal economic power and they do they are the ultimate ones controlling the farming operations they can exclude doing business with those guys i think my solution is not one to break up now well, they certainly did that in the energy industry uh standard oil is the classic example in which Rockefeller had the cheap, but and he had no kind, he effectively had eliminated all competition. They haven't quite gotten rid of all the farmers yet. They are real close to doing so. But here's the problem in many of these situations. And I asked the question, which side are you on boys? The government can choose one side or the other. Now, if they choose to go with the farmers, and I believe they will, because despite agribusiness's financial contributions to purchasing politicians, there is no stronger lobby in the United States Congress, and I run into these guys all the time, than the farmers and the cattlemen. They are like the first gold win that blows in from the north. And I always would try to emulate what they did. They march around Congress and they are listened to and they are treated everywhere they go uh, like royalty. Uh, but yes, uh, that's what I mean. That article was erroneous. The government has always taken the side of the independent farmer and even when years ago, conceivably, I mean, they do allow consolidation to take place, but it was not terribly widespread or took place in an accelerated fashion. So I think if you present a valid comp comp competitor to agribusiness, you will achieve the same ends. But I, that's what I mean. My knowledge of antitrust laws, my, you know, that's a legal solution. It's a good one. I'd say if it works, do it. Whatever get whatever direct direct action gets the goods pursued. You might want to pursue both, and really give corporate give them a hard time. I mean, you got to give them a two punch effort. I don't know, but you can let me know, sir. Thank you. All right, uh, Charlie. 
you know, up in Chicago, you've got the, you know, the commodity exchange, actually. Um, so one would, um, and of course, uh, farmers rely, rely upon that, you know, they, they get their, you know, um, like the, the futures uh, market and so on, um, they depend on. So, uh, you know, is that, I've, I've always felt that all these markets are rigged, actually. Um, is that another problem, actually, do you, or you don't know about that? Right. Because I think it is a problem. Again, I, I, I can't say, I don't think I'm qualified to say one way or another as to the app. I go past, my office is across the street from the Florida Trade, um, but my knowledge is is well, limited to that regard. You would, um, yeah, it, it, it certainly is, it, it certainly, the farmers are at the mercy, of course, of operations like that, which is not, they should not be. Now, if they get together collectively, they can get a greater presence uh, in that exchange. So again, uh, by concerted effort, and concerted meaning collective community, I think you can do snow. Organizing is difficult, admittedly to get everybody to cooperate. However, when you have no other alternative other than dissolution, I, that's what I mean. The other efforts at collective farming were had, had issues. However, in this case, it's in their best interest to cooperate and go along with a reorganization. That's the only thing you can include. If you talk to any of those farmers who were facing foreclosure and say, hey, listen, we've got to do something differently, I think they will listen to you. Okay, let, let me ask you another uh, parallel question. Most of these um, uh, agricultural states are very right wing along with the population. Um, and I've always thought it very strange because there's huge government sub subsidies, like the SNAP program, going into these communities. So they're basically they're living in this socialized system, and yet by and large, you know, then they vote for these extreme right wing uh, nutcases like Trump. I know. So how do you explain? That? How do I you explain in, that, Charles? I live in Kansas, <laughs> uh, which is uh, they cater to them and. Like either political party has certain solid constituent groups, um, so you know that exists out there. And the Republicans over the years, actually, I I think they have not serviced the farming community well at all, but they may pretend to. Um, you're seeing some cracks in that. Um, that. They're maybe not solidly buying into it. These people are not not readily changeable. Also, uh, anything regarding the conservative aspects of that um, is, I believe, very valid and true. Now, in Illinois, I ran into some gentlemen, and they were asking me, inquiring. They were putting in a factory farm in their county, and downstate Illinois. And I said, the only thing you can do is to possibly use environmental legislation to preclude this company from getting approval. And I said, the only thing is, you guys have been voting anti-green Republican for years. And now that you need this environmental legislation, you, 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 if we don't have it, you can only blame yourself. And they agreed. You, you, you want Republican who is anti-ecological. So now that you have a situation that you need environmental legislation, it may not be there. Well, and even the guy said, you know, you're right, Charlie. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. 
each party has claimed certain constituent groups. Uh, can we get fractions of them away? Uh, who knows, you know. These guys are kind of goofy, you know. I mean, come on, these are all Trumpers, man. <laughs> well, that's that's the conundrum. That's the conundrum, Charlie. Why why are these people so dependent on, on the government? Are so I mean, so you're going Trump into the valley of you're going into the valley of death. I mean, it's clear in these states. Yeah, you have democratic cities, and then you got these loony rural areas. You know, well, okay. okay. Isn't it true, Charlie, that, you know, we, we have a, you know, the right wing Trump is a climate deniers, okay, climate change deniers, and yet we're seeing these massive floods and the climate really, you know, being topsy turvy and, and, and the actual environment is slowly being destroyed actually over it. So, you know, one would think that the, the farmers would be, encouraging you know uh, environmental con uh, conservation and land conversation uh, conservation much more and yet you you'll never see that from the republicans you, you so maybe uh, maybe the, you know um maybe the democrats should have a, 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 a maybe they should woo the farmers more you know saying look we we must preserve the small farms and conserve the environment you know, cease polluting it. And remember in the Dust Bowl, the, the land blew into Washington, didn't it? <laughs> you know, so, you know, it was over farmed and basically blew away. The whole topsoil blew away. Well, it seems to me with the, with this um, climate catastrophe we're, we're headed into, we're going to see the same thing. So I don't know how you can uh, penetrate a brick. They don't have brains. They got like, you know, how do you put it? Listen, they're not going to, they're not, we have one in our email group. It, it does no good to try to discuss anything of this nature. It, it, it's kind of talking to yourself. Uh, they are not looking towards objective information. Yes, if I was a farmer, I sure as heck take it very seriously. And apparently that's what you're indicating. Well, that's what I mean. These guys are given the party line and they're assiduously watch Fox News every day. So they're climate deniers, climate change deniers. Well, <laughs> That's all lefty stuff. That's just lefty scare tactics. You know. Yeah, you think. Go ahead, you... Marilyn, ask a question. Go ahead, Marilyn, ask a question. You got Margaret, too, don't you? I'm wondering if maybe part of the problem yeah. with the farmers being so conservative is that so many, 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 many small farmers. Were, have, have been driven, you know, they've gone under. There's, a, I think, uh, what, 2% of the population now is in farming, where it used to be 90% at the time of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. So the small farmers that would be more open to, to ideas are gone. They've been you know, they had to go to the cities. So the ones that are left, maybe they're the, they were kind of the winners in the system, more or less. So maybe that's why they're more conservative. I, I don't know. I, I, um, you know, they're, they're, we're talking the Bible Belt kind, kind of people, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I lived among them. I, I very often never said anything. You know, I mean, they're like living in the past. What can I say? You know, uh, ninety-nine percent of the things I heard, I never responded because it was like, like just from outer space. You know, 
Hey, well, you weren't going to get anywhere. Try to convince them they were incorrect. You know, but no, they, uh, uh, and oh, they, they got some, they actually, you see it so much too in their notion of cities. I never told anybody I was from Chicago because you'd have to listen to a long litany of how life was impossible in a city. Or, or they seem to know Chicago because they changed trains there once uh, <laughs> and walked through the loop for half an hour downtown. Uh, I said I was from Illinois and I avoided listening to a lot of the, the nonsense. They think we're just in battleground situations and likely to survive uh in that regard but i mean they, they this is bible belt kind of stuff i mean they're not very receptive to uh liberal notions and concepts well I, I think the farmers that are left what's the average size of a farm now 500 or a thousand acres they're not at least you know, at least at least so they, they've kind of got a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. I'd say, you know, Charlie, Charlie, the uh, the majority of the uh, farmers or those in, in Congress or those that uh, were considered blue dogs. And and consequently, oh, okay. and consequently, because they were blue dogs, they might as well be Republicans because those are the guys that that took on the uh, real Democrats that are more liberal uh, uh, thinking. And, and I think you identify that very well by saying, uh, you know, why, why, why farmers uh, tend to uh, cater to the Republicans rather than, than go with the people that use their products, you know? I've had a deal with the blue dogs. What are you saying? These are, uh... Uh, they like fiscal economic policies, Democrats and blue dogs. And there's a whole bunch of them out of Minnesota. Yeah. And I deal with that delegation. Minnesota is a pretty progressive place ex with the exception of, that's what I mean, they're Democrats, but they're peculiar types of Democrats. And, you know, they want balanced budgets and Oh, how much is this going to cost? You know, uh, and we can't afford it. You know, and you're throwing money at stuff. You know, so you keep that in mind. And when I have to deal with them, there's a whole bunch of them in Minnesota, though. Uh, okay, uh, Margaret, you got a question? Yeah, your, yeah. I'm sorry, I just, I'm I just sorry you had to wait. No, it's all right. Um, I, I wondered if there was a book that came out a few years ago called What's the Matter with Kansas? And I was just wondering if yeah. you were with that book and would you recommend it to help understand this? I, I'm sorry I've known about it and I've never gotten around to reading it. Uh, uh, the only thing I can tell you is I was there with Bob Dole. I lived in the county and I knew the guy a doctor who ran against Bob Dole. And he actually had a good chance of beating him. But Bob Dole played dirty politics and he spread word. The guy had actually, the doctor had opened up a small rural hospital. These are really nifty kind of operations. They're very helpful in rural situations. Uh, certain situations, and he invested in his own funds to provide it for the community. <clears throat> and Bob Dole said he was profiteering on medicine. Oh. Oh, so well. he did stuff like that. And Bob Dole obviously won re-election. But yeah, he said, oh, this guy's just out to make money <laughs> and stick people. Well, yeah, I, 
that anyway. And I believe though. At any rate, I, I <coughs> would recommend that people look that up if they want, because I think it's an important question, actually. Now, um, there's an irritating bug like a cockroach in Kansas, and they're known as, they call them Democrats. And you know, Charlie, the governor of Kansas is a Democrat, and there's only two in the whole state. Yeah, I, I saw that they, uh, I didn't get a chance to read the article, but it looks like they got a Democratic governor there. Well, that's big Kansas City territory. Can Kansas City uh, beat some of those other towns, you know? Um, it's an interesting, you know, urban rural dichotomy, you know. And you know, Charlie, the same goes for uh, Kentucky. You got a Democratic guy now that got elected there and the rest of them were Republicans, you know? I can't believe they got that guy rad. He's a lunatic. Yeah. <laughs> He's an absolute lunatic. Yes. They elected a lunatic. Yeah, and, and, you're the, and you're the one that have the libertarians come and talk in Chicago. I mean, please. Oh. <laughs> well, we are free speech, you know. No, I know, but they, they're really... They have, they yeah, have I, well, they're extreme Republicans. That's all they are. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're just extreme Republicans. Um, and um, they, the thing about the libertarians is they're, they're ideology, they're wedded strictly to an ideology, not really issues, but they have like a code. Uh, <laughs> that they follow, it hasn't changed in years. You know, we are for this and we are for that. Um, but the that's the real, they don't have issues. I've asked them, I said, what are the issues in this campaign? And they look around at each other, you know, because they just reiterate the same thing. Less government, you know, free market, you know, don't do anything, you know, but uh, yeah, like here, don't do anything while all the farms, farms disappear. Yeah, that's a good idea. Good, good plan. They wait until all the small farms disappear and just let it happen, you know, let the government do nothing, you know, watch it happen. That's all. Just watch it happen, you know. Uh, that's what I mean. It, it's not a very accurate thing, but uh, yeah, I, 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 you would think it looked like Trumpism gave uh, some just, you know, what's scary is, is my own theory is that Trump actually gave justification, I'm probably not alone in this, to these loony ideas that they had in the past, which were maybe not public spoken too much of, but he comes along and now it's appropriate to be goofy, you know, I guess, you know, uh, but who knows? Um, and there's a lot of them. Come on, we just saw that last week, you know. Lorraine has her hand up there, Charlie. Oh, okay, Lorraine. Right, yeah, yourself. Charlie, um, you had indicated that you felt earlier in your presentation that um, you felt that government was trying to take care of the farmer, but um, I, I'm kind of at a loss and, and would like to know how you say that when obviously backdoor through the courts, um, government's kind of taking care of, of corporate Big far big farming enterprise, you know, you what was it, four or five you mentioned in general? Monsanto being the probably the biggest um welfare recipient because of all their patent on their their seed and how they've wiped out the small farmer and and all of that. 
you know, so I, uh, don't you think the government hasn't necessarily taken care of the small farmer when you look oh, at these no, no, big conglomerates no. coming at them? No, the farm consolidation began, let's just say after the war. It's been in progress, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. the, and we talked earlier there that the size of the farms have been growing incrementally over the years. Um, unlike, you have to think of small businesses. Mm -hmm. Small businesses can go down every day of the week and the Department of Commerce watches it. Uh, that's not been the case with the small farms beginning in particular the 50s. They, unlike other small economic enterprises, they wanted to preserve it. Uh, quite frankly, I don't want to sound cold, but I don't know why. Maybe they just persuaded the government. But any other, no, I'm not an economist. However, I do know that the economic policy for the United States was to preserve the small family farm operation, unlike other small family operations. And there's specific legislation, and believe me, there's a lot of legislation uh, specific, but that's been the case. And a good bit has been written about that, that we now this, some of the thinking was, was that we are an exporter of food. So it's obviously the thought was perhaps they're doing an excellent job and they conceivably are uh, doing a very good job at producing food. And so they wanted to preserve anything that looked like it was doing well. Uh, now, if you have any other type of small business, you're pretty much on your own and You'll get some assistance from the Department of Commerce, perhaps some loans and so forth, but pretty much um, when it comes to it, the, that ends. But the family farms definitely, believe me, me, I, they wouldn't exist at all. Given the economics of farming um, and with, with land subsidies and all, it, it is an incredible complex topic. Mm -hmm. I said, when sitting down doing this topic, I said, how in the world, Charlie, are you going to enca encapsulate some of the stuff that you're aware has gone on? That's what I mean. I had one, two or three slides. But I said, it's kind of boring stuff as well. And I don't know if I really want to get into it. But yes, they have made a concerted effort to preserve the farms. And presumably they are doing well or were doing well. Depends on who you talk to. But they were producing food um, uh, and for sale and export. And we weren't having food issues uh, that affected the general population. Who cares if a few poor people get hungry? They're just in the land or lacking attributes or who knows what. And make them go out and get a job and then they won't be hungry, you know? So, but no, they're, that's been pretty well known that they, they were uh, segregated in the economy um, for protection of the government. Now, they couldn't, the government, you're entirely correct, isn't powerful enough conceivably to stop agribusiness though. In, in their plans or evil plans. Mm -hmm. So as I said, which side are you on? Which side are they going to take? That's why an anarchist is not someone who's opposed to government, but he's opposed to a government that takes the side of the oppressor. That's what an anarchist says, who needs government if it takes the side of the person harming you? you know, oppressing mm -hmm. you. So that's a real definition of an anarchist. 
uh, that the government is, that's what it was at the turn of the century, the anarchists here in the progressive movement. But yes, agri business is somewhat moving ahead and you're entirely correct. They've got all, no obstacles apparently in the way of any significance. And the, the tragedy is they're gonna, <laughs> I mean, the cattle auctions don't exist anymore. There, there's no need for them. One guy comes in and buys the cattle and that's it. There's no auction. Mm -hmm. And no auction. One guy or two guys. <laughs> and you bring your cows and the guy gives you price and writes you check. You say thank you. That's how it works. You know, it's, a, it's amazing. You know, we have droughts in Australia as well, as it relates to obviously feeding cattle and sheep and the like. And um, in those really severe times, they, it, even though it's a much smaller population, but I, I, we're in Texas, obviously, I don't see it would be a big deal. Um, but what they encourage when these things go on over there is um, all the grass clippings from people mowing their lawns are literally delivered to a place in Sydney and it's shipped out to the farming communities so the livestock can eat that, you know, so it's not going to waste. And it, it helps save some of these herds rather than here they say, oh, drought coming, well, let's just sell them. We'll take it at a loss and there's a slaughter and then you have to raise new and, and so on and so forth. And um, so I don't know if they've fully developed a proper plan to, to get over that. The other thing, part of your presentation is you covered obviously the, the growth of, of corn but the cost that that kind of farming and manufacturing has brought onto society, just in obesity alone, with all the corn and oil products that are there, um, is, is astronomical, you know, to our, our health. And, you know, so really what we're paying at, the super, at, at a supermarket level is a drop in the bucket as to what the long-term costs to the consumer are for the food that we are now eating as a result, as it relates to this corporate farming world, okay? And another thing that I saw today, and I, I wonder what you think of that, as well as I don't know if you had heard, um, because they're obviously going to a lot of plant-based stuff. So we've got a drought there and it just seems to be problematic you know, if we've got drought conditions and falling water tables, you know, trying to develop a lot of plant-based stuff. So if there's a problem for you in that, and today or yesterday I'd heard they're trying to grow meat in a lab now from, you know, a cell yeah. of a pork or a calf and that. And, and you know, one, what do you think of that? Because they claim the benefits of, protecting, you know, uh, the greenhouse, uh, you know, contributing and all this stuff. But all the crap that we're taking in into our systems on a daily basis, and the uh, even though you try to avoid corn oil, it, it's out there in some size, shape or form. Uh, you know, what do you think and where is it all going to bloody end, you know? Because the, well, the mineral content in our soil today isn't anywhere where, what it was when we were growing up, if you would agree with that. I, I left out something in the presentation there and the grocery store portion. Now there's three people involved. There's the guy who grows the product, the farmer, mm -hmm. and in the middle there's the food processor. And at the, the other end is the grocery store guy. Now, grocery store guys don't make very much money. It's a very low profit operation. They may, maybe if they clear a penny or two per dollar, they're doing well. They, that's why supermarkets, if you try to sell them, uh, 
don't bring a big price tag because they're not tremendously profitable operations. Now, we also saw that farms are also not profitable operations. So you were talking there about food quality. You guys in the middle are the guys that are making all the money and they're the guys that are making this stuff that they put a label on it and you're supposed to pretend it's food. A lot of times it's just enormous quantities of corn syrup or sugar and you're supposed to think it's nutritional uh, when it's far from it but yeah the I think um, producing silage like you say is pretty interesting I I guess grand yeah grass clippings if you collect enough of them you know that would be a good thing um, but uh, yeah, this rather interesting program. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to look that up. Um, yeah, it, it silage is a, a lot of people don't know that it, that's where you get you take all kinds of you, the stalks and so forth, and you grind it up and you add all kinds of things to it, and the cows like it. You let it cook a while in silos and things like that, and cows love that. You know. So it's one way of now um, out west. A lot of times they let the cattle just graze in the fields. You know they leave the corn stalks and they uh, will feed on that. But making silage, especially if you have a dairy operation where you've got to feed your your stock, uh, they're very intensive on silage. Now uh, there's another thing about cattle too is uh, like the pigs I said they're uh, uh, single cell operations uh, cattle why they would use silage is because there's feeder lots uh, far all the farmers may raise the cows uh, like I was raising baby the boy cows but then when they get a certain size they're fed sent to a feeder lot which is another special kind of farming operation in which they, in, in essence, fatten the cows up for market. So yeah, silage is very, th those guys would pay anything for it because they're in the market to add weight to the cattle. All right, we got, who else? Anybody else? Patrick, you guys all agree with me, I guess. Andrew, any questions? Oh, go ahead, uh, Andy. I'm glad to see everyone agrees with me. No, Anthony uh, had his hand up there. Yeah, uh, Charlie, uh, w one of the things I wanted to mention is that, you know, probably the reason that a lot of uh, farmers went out of business early on was because the government discouraged them from, uh, uh, growing anything, they paid him so that they wouldn't grow what they, whatever they were farming, and and consequently, with time, they didn't they didn't farm anymore. So they had to look for other avenues to do it because the big farmer was the one that was making uh, all the money and 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 all the profits. So the, the little guy couldn't farm anymore because it wouldn't allow him to to uh, grow stuff and then sell it in the in the small market. Well, I, I know a great deal has been written on that, that why are we paying an operation? That's what I mean. We're talking about boosting the, the family farm. Amazingly enough, we're paying a small businessman to not do any business, which, yeah, many people kind of objected to. Now, a lot of people don't realize it, that if you own a farm and if you're not inclined to farm it, uh, you lease it out. And in essence, that land conceivably is never uh, sitting, not being used or fallow. So uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert on this topic, but yes, people were a little, that's what I mean. We're paying businessmen 
to do nothing. I, in essence, you know, uh, I guess some sort of insurance against the future. Uh, it's good to have farms handy if you need them. Uh, yeah, the farm policy. Now, if you, you know, that's another thing about operating a farm. You may want to grow crops and chance it on the market. If you think, John was talking about, do you think the market is um, going to be good? You might want to grow corn and sell it. You could also grow corn and store it. I've helped put together silos and they store corn until they want to look for the right time to sell it. Um, so you have to, you know, use, use some uh, savvy in your operation. Um, you may want to just lease the land. You may want to buy feed. Um, I, I, that's what I mean. It's the economics. Sit down, what are you capable of? If you can't afford seed, fertilizer, herbicides, and you can't get a loan, yeah, the option of not farming it or leasing it out makes perfect sense so that the operation doesn't go under. Uh, you stay in operation. Uh, you're not making in a great deal of money. Uh, you're not doing any work either, but it may be something you might consider doing. Let's say you can't get a loan to farm that season uh, or sufficient. It's what I mean, I was talking about there. You got to put seed in that, in that seed drill. Well, that might be $25,000. Then you got to come along, you got you to put some hydrogen on that field. You know, we're talking some real money here. You know, so uh, that's the economics of it. You got to be uh, use use this sense what you, what your situation is, what the market is at the time being. Um, that will determine what you do. Um, anyhow, I hope that answers it. Yeah, that's been a controversial thing. Uh, urbanites don't really care for that. Charlie, um, you know, the government was at one point, you know, subsidizing people, farmers not to grow certain uh, times of the year or not to grow in particular, but also that was a scheme that was obviously abused by the very wealthy, like Rockefellers were getting money not to grow on land that they had no intentions of ever growing anything on. Oh, yeah. Uh, they got their subsidies, okay? And then they realized that was a boondoggle they probably had to do away with, okay? So then the next thing is, um, so they, and I don't know if they're still doing this, but I know this was a plan they had adopted at one point, was then instead of giving away billions of let's not grow, um, then they gave away billions to uh, that impacted substantially the corporate farming world and probably the small farmer as well, which is not so small nowadays anyhow, um, because they tend to grow for also the corporate farming uh, entity. But they were then subsidizing by paying the uh, corporate or the farming insurance, your know, crop insurance premiums. And so, um, so here we are as taxpayers subsidizing corporate farming to guarantee that they really won't have a bad year because if their crop fails, they're still reimbursed for um, a crop that was never delivered. You know, they can't lose no matter which way you buy and, and we are paying for those premiums. But the government does not, you know, pay our premiums for our loss of income in any right. given year. Unemployment doesn't hack it by a long shot, okay? And so I'm just wondering, you know, and I don't know if there are any other parts of industry 
you know, that, that are subsidized like this. It's just like all these profits that are being taken now by these greedy corporations because they're trying to make up for maybe not as much as they made during the pandemic, although I really didn't see them suffering that much back then either. Um, and they're posting all these profits and no one's stopping them from doing that because that would be a big hullabaloo as well. And, um, you know, and, and we're paying, we're subsidizing stuff that is a, of a lower quality nutritionally than we ever used to eat prior to this. I mean, the nutritional value, the mineral content in soil today compared to what it was when we were growing up as kids is minuscule, comparatively speaking. We also ate fresh produce every day, at least we did in Australia, and even fresh meat from the butcher. Nothing was processed en masse as it is now. And so much of what is even being processed en masse, the basis of which is a GMO-based growth uh, foundation. You know, and I'm thinking of this, uh, if they're starting this lab thing with regard to meat, I mean, where are we all going with this? You know, uh, it, it just is unbelievable to me. And I, what are your thoughts about that? Well, the regarding crop insurance, during the pandemic, I don't know the details, but a small business can get, I guess you call it, the catastrophic insurance against something that happens to shut down, let's you know, say your restaurant. Uh, certain small businessmen were cheap and chose not to secure policies like this. Well, along comes the pandemic and mandates a lockdown or people just stop going out. And so they were in a crisis situation. So who bailed them out but the government? So there was assistance. I don't know the details of the bailout, the subsidies to the Small Business Administration. I know the Chicago Business uh, Department uh, had seminars on this topic. I didn't participate, but they were kept from going out of business, so to speak, by an appropriation or grant from the government. And I believe it even came to a second time as well. Um, there was some doubt question about even the second time, if it was necessary. I'm not an expert on, on pandemic appropriations, mm -hmm. but I do know that they were compensating businesses in some fashion um, who chose not to take the necessary precautions against situations that come up that would put them out of business. So yeah, they profited in that regard. Um, but the know, corporate they, farming didn't have to pay the premiums. The government is paying their premiums. The government does not pay the premiums for the small business. The government okay. does not pay a premium to protect our paycheck should something go amiss. And therefore we can get the same money the next year from the insurance company in order to maintain our homes, mortgages, so on and so forth. For them, I they didn't just know that. I, I, I didn't know that. That's um, crop insurance. Yeah, the... Um, um, I, I don't know though that, I think it's, it's a 50, 50 deal right now between the small farmers and, uh, and the big ag in Congress. I, I think they're, they're both, uh, doing about equal way. I, I, you know, if I had a, a scorecard on the fight, you know, <laughs> Uh, I'd give it a 50, 50, five and five, you know, uh, if I was the 
judging the match. Um, so yeah, there there certainly are occasions when uh, they misuse the the role of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, who who in their right mind wants to preserve corporate farming? That's ridiculous. Mm. <laughs> you know, and, and and the other side of the coin, they could argue, and you could be rather malicious and say. Why are we preserving small agricultural operations which are not profitable? You know, let let the if you are a lazy fair, I'm not an economist, you know, Adam Smith economist. If they can't make it in the market, then let them fail, you know. And like there you saw an auction, someone's gonna buy their operation, you know. By the way, the other thing I wanted to say about the another aspect of farming that isn't is somewhat talked about is the infrastructure that is required. It's an incredibly the infrastructure, not in not only addition in land, but you've got to have a an equipment operation of some of the most pricey machines. On Earth, there is nothing more expensive. I mean, there are remarkable devices. A, a combine harvester, you don't have to steer it. You could get in there and they got GPS now. And you have a map of the fields and it goes in a perfect straight line. You could go to sleep. You don't even have to be in there. It probably shut off itself. and do the entire field. That's what I mean. They're incredible devices. And much actually in automatic, they're much better. I tried matching the, the computer, and the computer beat me every time in harvesting. You know, another thing is people don't realize a lot of farmers don't you sell those combines, harvesters. They don't buy that equipment. You saw that V-shaped thing where they were harvesting the crops. Those are custom harvesters. They're fascinating operations. They begin harvesting, uh, let's say, wheat in, in Texas, and they put the uh, harvesters on flatbed trucks and travel from farm to farm. Um, and make their way north as the summer, spring and summer. Um, so they, the farmers will pay them, uh, someone as well. So that's what I mean, you could be a farmer and you know, actually you could be a farmer and not really do anything like the Rockefellers, you know, you really don't have to get dirty, you know, <laughs> be a gentleman farmer, you know, and Play to market, what have you, and have other, you know, and you could do quite well. Uh, you think about it, it doesn't happen that often, I don't think, but that's what I mean. Um, you don't, know, you don't have to get shoveling manure or anything, <laughs> you know, dealing with pigs or anything, you know, you just, uh, but yeah, the, Investment in infrastructure and land. Now you got you got that much money sunk into it. That's what I mean. Uh, does crop insurance, whatever, cover your investment? I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not a. You know, an MBA. Anybody else? Come on, guys. I well, we got nothing else. Tommy, you want to go to Tommy? You're muted. Tommy, you're muted. Hey, this Didn't is hear you, Tom. It together, right? Tom is muted. I really enjoyed putting this one together. I did. This was fun. There we go. Me. 
No, I'm on mute. Good uh, question. I had a I know learn, fellow lives in uh, Pawpaw, Illinois, who has a uh, who his own farms, and uh, he uh, his biggest complaint, believe it or not, is that the fuel costs are so high that that it's put him out of business. He's got uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, for example, when you're in rural areas, you have to use uh, propane gas to heat things, and uh, Propane has gone up 500% from what it was. And so that, that's part of what has caused this food chain. Uh, this, I think that's part of what has caused the, the increased prices at the grocery store is the food, is the, is the uh, food chain, the whole thing. The whole economy is out of whack because of it. And uh, I've been after our government to, uh, to regulate the oil industry you know, because uh, that, that would solve a lot of problems. That would lower the bring the cost down, and would, uh, but nobody seems to pay any attention to that. But anyway, I thought I'd mention that to you. No, I actually, what little I do know is that we were talking about machinery and the infrastructure. Uh, those things are not, but they they drink a lot of a lot of gasoline. Uh, I mean, you're talking about a massive piece of equipment uh, you have to have, and you've got to operate. It's like a small factory. So you've got to have some real power there. It's not, they're not, they're not small scale. So they're drinking gasoline up like you wouldn't believe. Um, that, that's quite true. Um, we're talking some real money here. Yeah, it can be affect your out your final outcome. That that's an overhead cost that uh, is significant. Believe you me, uh, I'm not certain of the miles per gallon of a combine, but I would doubt that it's very much at all. Um, that it's just, I mean, you you, you see what it's like. It's the largest, you know, like the largest thing I've ever stood, I, item that I stood next to that that moved. I said, wow, these move. And it does all kinds of things. You know, there's wheels and gears. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, one other thing I wanted to say though, is that I just came across this figure though. Um, farming is still a very dangerous occupation though. Uh, it ranks among the top three of hazardous, like lumberjacking or something, you know. So there is a downside to it. Things do happen in farming operations. There's all kinds of moving belts and cutting knives and stuff like that and equipment. Um, so it still is a hazardous occupation. And if anything, we do owe some measure of gratitude to the farmers in that regard, you know, um, accidents do happen, you know, uh, the, actually the strangest accident I ever heard of, there were some ag, ag agents and they set the field on fire to, to kill the weeds and so forth. And then their car got stuck <laughs> and it burned up. <laughs> I gotta go back and tell the boss they burned up the car. <laughs> <laughs> Idiots. Charlie, what do you attribute? I mean, every year, even outside of COVID, okay, whether it be Thanksgiving uh, or like in the summertime, oil goes up because they know there's going to be more oil pumped to, to go on vacation and what have you. So they really take advantage of it. Um, and every Thanksgiving that I can ever remember, even prior to COVID, there's always been, oh, there'll be a shortage of cranberries this year, or uh, turkeys will cost that much more, or bread will go up, or what have you. It doesn't matter. Um, but obviously, it's on steroids right now about every kind of food product out there, eggs, milk, what have you. Um, and so a sugar flour, okay, everything that impacts this particular meal coming up, but any meal 
basically. Um, and yet these corporations are posting these major, major profits. Okay, General Foods, you know, their cereals have gone through the roof. It's all sugar. What do you think is wrong with the, um, the average citizen that they're not being more passionate and putting their foot down about this and just stop buying a product, for instance, like they were back in the 70s, whether it be meat prices going up or uh, the lettuce boycott because of the uh, farm workers you know, being stopped from unionizing and so on and so forth. What's wrong with the passion level in this country right now that people aren't saying it's enough and we're not going to, you know, keep your cereal, you know, or don't buy it, you know, don't have meat, you know, find a, a substitute for a while uh, and make it national like it used to be what's happening here because they're just taking their profits and people are trying to blame it on like Biden, for instance, like he has anything to do with that. Uh, and it's global. It's not just here. It is absolutely global. What is going on with the world that they are accepting this as, well, what can you do? Well, I, as I say, I talked about the middleman, the processor, um, a little bit of trivia, there's something like three to 5,000 items in a standard grocery store. Mm -hmm. And you don't need that many. I was looking at, well, I was buying mustard and there were like four or five or six different kinds. This is just regular mustard, mm -hmm. not the fancy stuff. And I'm going, well, it's nice. The store gave me a variety, but you know, seems kind of overdoing it. Now, yeah, there's some, to one extent fierce competition. Um, guys like H.J. Hines have seem to have made a lot of money at this and Del Monte. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind is you're paying more for the can when you buy canned goods than the food inside of it. That can cost, you know, I actually had a job, printing job one time, designing food labels for cans. That was fun. <laughs> uh, I also did jams and jellies. And I, okay, I shouldn't digress from this. I, in a fun moment, they asked me to design this jelly label. And the guy used the name named after him and his wife, who was like H and J Jelly. And I said, this is about as boring as you can get. So I, I played around and I made something called the Happy Grape Jelly. And just for fun, I said, this is, I gave him, I said, here you go, this is what you should call it. And he brought it home to his wife to show it this goofy guy that the print shop came up with. And his wife liked it and they placed an order. <laughs> but yeah, we've got things that are not nutritional, have little or no nutritional value. Our lace, there's a whole profession called food chemists who, who I've known some personally who make money adding things to it. Um, you know, there's quality control kind of situations. The amazing thing about food processing, I invite everyone to watch these shows. Like, I, I watch them, they're on every morning for me, is how it's made. There's various versions of this. I watch one series that comes out of Canada, and they go from factory to factory, and they make everything under the sun. And they show you the entire operation. So you see a pe making peanut butter and mustard and, and cupcakes and bread and everything. They, the amazing thing is at the speed of these operations that we pay anything at all for food. I mean, they can produce food. That's why I've often wondered 
why are they charging us so much? Mm -hmm. I mean, they they will do like incredible numbers, like they will cap a hundred battles a minute. And I'm going, do we really need that much ketchup? <laughs> Who is buying all this? And yeah, there's obviously money to be made. As I say, I think there's a separate world of the commercial retailing of food. Uh, and there sometimes is competition, sometimes isn't, you know, branding, they call it. Um, people earn their living now with branding, uh, things like that. Now, the other thing you brought in, there's really two kinds of agriculture. There's this food agriculture, and that's California stuff. And you do find it spread around the United States. I mean, there are berries grown in Michigan. There are farm significant farm worker presence, I know, in Michigan. But that's largely California stuff or deep south, but entirely California. And now you've got this other world of agriculture. What we've been talking about tonight, it mixes, goes back and forth. Um, the ag real agriculture we think of old McDonald had a farm. That's traditional farming with cows and sheep and pigs and all that. But this California stuff is a whole different world and all different operations. Um, the tomato thing, I just think of one, one area, tomatoes, they harvest them in enormous bins. You saw the guys picking tomatoes for individual consumer consumption. You go to California, they just, they just throw them in enormous flatbed trailer trucks. A lot of the, yeah, the food stuff is probably regular food that we think of is deals in quantities of tractor trailers. I wonder why are we paying so much for this? You know, there's so much of it. It's incredible. And they get loads and loads and loads of it. Now, even potato chips. They take potatoes, you know, they deliver whole semi trailer trucks all day long, like 10 of them. And why? Well, it should be like about a quarter or 25 cents a bag, you know. Um, but yeah, that's what I mean. You have branding and market. Uh, I'm not a grocer guy, but yeah, it's long been known that the, that's what I was trying to say. I think there are three parties and the farmer's getting cheated and the grocery store guy's getting cheated too. And I think the consumer's getting cheated most of all. Marilyn, Marilyn. I'm, I'm wondering, do you think maybe one reason the small farmer has gone out of business is, I mean, one of the reasons is because they kind of got hooked on commercial agriculture using genetic um, hybrid seeds and they required a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer and a lot of a lot of monetary input to make it grow so that kind of put them in hock then to the you know the seed companies and fertilized big you know the big oil that produced all this nitrogen fertilizer uh i know over in india a lot a lot of hundreds of thousands of small farmers went under in the last couple of decades after Monsanto came in and talked the Indian agricultural system into adopting Monsanto seed and Monsanto fertilizer and so on. And those all required irrigation that the farmers didn't have. 
So it seems to, I'm wondering if that's part of the problem that small farmers went under is because they got so entrapped in high input commercial agriculture. Yeah, that's true. They do have a monopoly of the seed market. They're entirely correct. And you've got to pay the guy whatever he demands. You're not authorized to use your own seed. If you do so, you probably will get sued for drifting and spoiling yes. your neighboring farms. Uh, yes, they have managed and manipulated and won in courts uh, to, and like he was saying, a virtual monopoly. Uh, they consider it corporate property rights, intellectual property rights, so to speak, I guess. Um, yeah, it, you have, it's either use ours or you don't use any um, situation. I don't know if they're necessarily reaping windfall profits. I would question only the companies are making profits and probably pretty good. Um, enough to be comfortable. Uh, could it reduce the price of our food? Of course. Um, but if you manage to control one part of the process, you know, um, you know, the, now the guys try to do it on their own. And they say there's this campaign like buy local, which doesn't mean anything. Buy local could be 500 miles away. But the lefties were saying, go to the farmer's market and buy local. The, the thing is, when you try to buck the system, you know, it can be very expensive depending on your operation. <laughs> I heard outrageous prices for eggs. You know, you try to, you saw that chicken, chicken guy. Well, you try to do your own chicken ranch you don't you don't go along with the 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 crowd, you know. Like eggs would be like eight dollars a dozen, you know. Or so you know. That do, do you have a market? Who's going to pay eight dollar, ten dollars a dozen? You know, uh, you have to grow your own grain or something. You know, it's 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 not even competitive in any fashion. Yeah. Um, we are, yeah, I think you're good. That's what I mean. If we put up a kind of, that's what I was trying to say. You got to put up a significant competition with the strength to develop their own, produce their own seed, let's say, co op seed, buy out the kelp corn, somebody, you know, what gives them their, their edge? And you got to be able to compete with them in that regard if they're running a, vertical operation, you got to have one too. Um, the little guy hasn't got any chance at all. Um, specialty stuff. Um, the, I, I was just with my cousins, they like one, one family type produce operation. And it's a real nice, friendly people and produce nice produce of all different kinds and pumpkins and so forth. But they're they're just barely, barely making it. You know, they're, they're competitive with competing with California produce, um, you know, in Illinois, the family operation. But they couldn't afford like to repair their coolers, you know, my my cousin's a repairman and he was doing it as a favor to them. But that's what I mean, uh, small scale operations, you've got a pretty tough, you know, farm stand type operations, you know. Yeah, the market's against you, you know, you can't, can't compete. Then answer your question, maybe I forgot your original question there. Oh, you were talking about the different things, yeah, you, you've got to, 
you know, it, it's chemical intensive agriculture. <laughs> you know, hey, you pouring all kinds of stuff on the soil. You know, that, uh, that that's what they're into. They don't care, you know. No. Are we out of questions? Are we out of questions? We go to rebuttals. There's no rebuttals because who could, could, could argue against? Well, there might be a rebuttal. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Observations of people and whatever. Who wants the first rebuttal? Yeah, I, I I would just like to make a comment. You know, um, the other week or last week, one guy from Chicago was saying that there was no such thing as gouging. Well, you know. Mm. The most, that's the most ludicrous comment I think I've ever heard. What, what actually, what actually we see is global cartelism in food, mm -hmm. as as well as oil, and of course, you know that's contrary to any free market, free trade notions. You know that that, that is supposed to be the the core of the capitalist system. And, and Tom Brick brings up the point when, when you have this concentration, you must have regulations. Otherwise, of course, but, uh, but we're headed more and more to a fascist system. Because when you have corporations running running things, that's that's a definition of, of fascism. And that's where we're headed. You see it more and more. And so I think, you know, really, when you look at all of this and you see that I think I think that. Seed company, one seed company controls something like 80% of all the seed or something like that. It's just, just amazing, the, the concentration that we've seen. And of course, there is the economy of scale, of course, that makes things cheaper and cheaper, you know. But uh, when you have that kind of concentration, you must have regulation. You must. But you see, both, both parties, you know, uh, regulations don't, don't, doesn't seem to appeal to them, as Thomas found out. So I, you know, really, and and so without regulations, people are being ripped off more and more and more, and and you see the cost of living is going through the roof. I think it's you know it's come down a bit, but uh, what to seven percent now a year or something. But even that is, you know, way above the two percent target that the Federal Reserve tries to aim for. And of course, the only the only weapon the Federal Reserve has is to crash the economy, which they'll probably do if they want to reach two percent. So I think you know really the whole thing. And I think that you know the reason why the Democrats lost the House is because they didn't control the, the economy because right? they don't believe in it apparently. And so, like, well, but for the abortion issue, I think they'd have lost the Senate as well. Anyway, so that's my comment. With that, I'm going to go and have a drink someplace, okay? <laughs> so good night, folks. <laughs> Charlie, Tony Padilla, I think you made a great presentation, Charlie, and uh, you mentioned a lot of things that we, sometimes we take for granted, that we that we know where things are coming from and where the, where they originate. But uh, I think you, you opened our eyes, you know, and I want to thank you so much. And I'm going to go have a drink, too. <laughs> Marilyn. Yeah, yeah, I would say that was a very good, Charlie. That was a really good presentation about farm in general, and you you know a lot about it and uh, appreciate it. Well, I don't know how much gasoline a tractor uses. I I as many I actually read books about tractors, the history of them. I never read the figure how much gas to use. I have no idea. Yeah, it might be something relevant, yeah. Lorraine, you get your, your hand up there? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say excellent presentation and your graphics were really good, Charlie. Very professionally put together, um, which is always enjoyable when you, you know, especially that they're also time relevant graphics as well it's really good so um my uh you know comments on that are, are nothing but positive the uh, and i just i again when i was asking before about you know this corporate greed and the like and you know why uh, first off i agree with you on the middlemen and there seems to be more middlemen 
in every aspect of our life. Okay, right now, uh, you know, we we have it in the um, pharmaceutical world. Uh, you know, it's it's been there obviously in the corporate farming world. Um, you've got it now. Um, coming to a major head when it all when they own it all. You know, this Taylor Swift concert fiasco that's going on and the collecting of these fees and you can never talk to anyone. So, you know, all this, uh, people are reliant on just accepting what's put in front of them. There's no real place to complain. You know, everything's electronic and I just think it's going to get worse before it gets a lot, you know, cleaner than what it is right now. And I just think that we're being treated in an incredibly disrespectful way and and that they don't really want to hear what you say so they make it even more difficult for you to project your voice anywhere other than to one press one for this press two for that um and fill out this um you know complaint we'll be sure to have one of our associates get back to you there's only ever a form letter anyhow so um and it's in every aspect of our lives and this you know in the food industry and and um and the fact that we're even getting less product less nutritional product on top of everything else um which has long term consequences to our children their growth i mean um and the world's being, you know, all this plastic bottle nonsense is what even down to that, you know, water bottles and and then you got other issues out of that that just, you know, goes on to climate. And and the kids aren't getting fluoride in the water anymore because they're not drinking the public water because the public water isn't trusted. The public water is also running out. And it just like, you know. It, it's almost like you can see Soylent Green, you know, the film Soylent Green in your future. If you haven't seen it, I suggest that you do watch it because it's very telling of what happens when the, bur the earth um, burns itself, okay? And there is no farming anymore. And, um, you yeah, know, basically the very wealthy can afford through the black market to maybe have a piece of meat or some specialty, but this um, this green product is what the rest of society eats. And basically what it is, is the they're eating themselves. Okay, that's the catch to the film. And um, the people that are just so despondent, they wanna give up and then they get turned out into protein for the rest of society to eat. Um, Charlton Heston's in it, so it's a horror, he's a horrible actor, but it does tell a point. Okay, gives very much point. And um, so I, I just am just flabbergasted that I don't know, you know, what it is about society today that people, all this crap is happening to them, but no one's doing anything about it. And that really is very disturbing to me. You know, I refuse to pay a certain amount of money I don't care, and, and steak isn't what it used to be anyhow, but I wouldn't pay the money to try and get what they think is the best steak available because it's still not going to be as it used to be and because it's been so modified with all this GMO feed and, and all that. And then the corn industry's gotten so bad beyond just wanting to put it in our cars, you know, for ethanol and the like. I mean, at one point, they're trying to, and I don't know, they may have already achieved it. They were literally trying to feed corn to uh, fish and salmon, like salmon farms and the like, you know, to to get that to be the food basis. I mean, eventually we're, we're, we're scorching our own earth, just growing corn alone as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so I don't know. It's just how I feel, and I don't know where the end is, but but I don't understand why the consumers aren't jumping up and down and and voicing this, this uh, horror show that's being presented to us as food uh, and in smaller containers to boot so they get their profits even more there. 
you know, can't buy a can of cranberries now. It used to be 16 ounces. It was 15 ounces. Now it's 14 ounces. I mean, on and on it goes. And it's greed, greed, greed. And no one seems to be doing much about it. So anyhow, but great presentation, Charles. Oh, thank you. Margaret, Margaret, do you have a, Margaret? Margaret, do you have any comments? Closing? Yeah, mute yourself. I've had a long day. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, what's um, in your refrigerator? What? What's in your, what's in your refrigerator? <laughs> frozen, frozen ravioli. Drink. <laughs> frozen ravioli and fresh spinach. That's we haven't eaten dinner yet. So yeah. Oh, okay. Well. So we'll get. It. I made bread yesterday, <laughs> so that was good. I anyway. But but I you know this this the consolidation of of the business practices in agriculture is you know all part of the capitalist thing and it's definitely does not have the welfare of of people in general um, as one of its primary goals by any stretch of the imagination the the difficulty is in the um, in, in my mind, and I haven't really made a big deal of this, but in the, in the economies of scale that you have little farmers, for example, we buy our meat from a farmer up in Wisconsin, and he's a group of farmers, and they raise their, their beef on grassland. They have open, um, open range that the, that the cattle are on, or at least on their farm it's open. Mm -hmm. And open an open range for the pigs and and um, and they're it's not so open for the chicken, but they are out in the in the air and they they're not within walls, so they they get a lot of fresh air and stuff. But it it's an it can be an it's an expensive operation or fairly expensive, but it's a group of of small farmers that work together. And and do this, and he delivers all over the, the Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana, and I think even there's a place in uh, Michigan that that he eventually goes to. But and so he they're they're working. I don't know how long they'll be able to do this, but they're they're they work on it, and the meat is good, and the animals seem to be raised humanely. So you know. Probably I should we should stop eating meat altogether, or at least much less than we do. But that's I wasn't raised like that, and I don't cook like that. So there you go. And so, um, but it's it's they they really you can't you cannot I don't think you can raise enough meat meat to feed the people who are eating now in this country. Um, unless you use the factory farming methods. I don't think so. Now, I might be wrong about that, but but I don't think so that, that you have to have these, you have to have these economies of scale. And to do that, you have to use methods that are not humane. And um, at least during the time that the animal is being raised and use antibiotics and I think something like eighty percent of our antibiotics are produced uh, are used in agriculture, and mm. to um, maintain animals on low level antibiotics, which is increased, but seriously increased things like come on, stop it. Seriously increased things like antibiotic resistant bacteria and um, all of these health issues that we have. So um, it's a it's a serious problem, and if we don't start using the and, and the agricultural dollars, our our tax dollars, to really mm -hmm. support the people who have humane methods and who do sustainable farming, um, you know, then we're, we're we are seriously stuck with this very destructive and long term consequences of the very destructive of the system that we've got now. And so, the health and the health consequences also 
from even the hormones they're putting to grow these animals oh, yeah. out to kick her. And all of a sudden, we're surrounded by six foot tall kids. You know, yeah, well, I remember good. when I was coming up, I'm, I was five foot six and everyone else around me was five foot two and five foot four. And I really felt like an Amazon at five foot six. <laughs> you know? well, oh, my niece, my nieces are five ten. But but height in women, actually, my grandmother was five ten and she was born in 1879. So, you know, it's not whatever, it's, it's, it's in the family. I didn't get that particular gene. I'm only... Yeah, yeah but I mean, five. girls are having yeah. periods, you know, well before oh, yeah. their teens. They have breasts. I didn't get a period until I was 14. Well, they, you know, my they mother get, was 17. They get, they get pregnant at 10. Yeah, I mean, exactly the point, you know. Yeah. So what they're putting in our food source is really damaging our body, we don't even, I don't think we even understand, fully understand the long term we don't. We truly feel do that's going on here. And it, it's very disturbing to me. And I don't know that it's so much of a production thing because while they've done this, they've also totally screwed up the taste of the product because mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I don't eat that much beef, period. I mean, a, a steak would be the last thing I would ever think to order in a restaurant. But they're also blowing up the chickens. They're blowing up the pork. I mean, you know, I mean, it's all changed the taste of these things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going vegetarian tomorrow or anything along those lines. But it's, it's really, I think, very dangerous. And I don't know. I don't know what the population of this country was in the 70s when I first came here, but I do know that, um, you know, when you went into a supermarket, one of the first relationships I always form, and even to this day, but, but especially in a new city, um, is my relationship with the butcher, you know, and how, because I am very high maintenance when it comes to how I want my meat prepared and, and all that. And I get what I want. What you have to do is ask and they will accommodate. But the difference being is that in the 70s, they literally had the carcasses yeah. hanging in the back of the butcher shop in the supermarket and they cut off what they needed and so on and so forth. And then that now changed, no more carcasses. So they send different sides and what have you. And then the, you know, in boxes, you know, so you've got butts or loins or with this or that, right? And the butcher still cuts it to how I want it, okay? But now some stores are even getting to the point where they are not even, they are prepackaging it, you know? So they will put so many chops, and that's all they're shipping to the markets, okay? And they, and um, so it's whatever has been prepacked. So that saves people at the counter that need to have meat cutters around, you know, and they're just having people take packages out of containers and stick them on a shelf, period. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's arriving. And again, I, I don't know why. Now my butchers unpackage those things and pack them how I want them packed, okay? Probably their, their bosses wouldn't appreciate that, but that's how it's, you know, it's at Sprouts. But it's like I don't understand why people are settling for this as, as being okay. And, and all the flavor has gone out of, of all this, this product. I mean, the day was, you know, back in the 70s and even early 80s, you could buy a sirloin steak on the bone. You can't find a sirloin steak on the bone to save your life anymore. Okay, and at least you could barbecue it. it had you know, uh, it wasn't as lean as it is, and um, it was a you know for a cheap barbecue steak, it was it was fine and it was satisfying. I wouldn't think of it now, but you know what I'm saying? It, it, it's crazy what we ex accept. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think one reason people are accepting it is all the artificial flavors that are now put in foods. The artificial they don't know that, I mean, the, the, not only the meat, but the fruits and the vegetables have no flavor either. Exactly. So, so what they do is, if you read the ingredients, 
The only, there is nothing you can buy in a package that doesn't have flavoring added to it. Yep. So, so that's what they're doing is covering it up with, with flavoring and salt and sugar. Um, yes. And so people don't know how to read the label. They don't understand that the first ingredient listed is the majority of ingredients. It, it disintegrates on, on uh, volume as it goes forward on the list. And the majority of them are just, uh, you know, heavily on the corn and and sugar. And I mean, it's not even just corn syrup, it'll go into sucrose. I mean, it's, it's given to you in five different, um, you know, uh, names, but it's still sugar no matter which way you, you hack it, or the artificial flavoring. So anyhow, I just, it's crazy, Bill. Well, this one's standing. All right, well, uh, I want to thank our speaker for doing a great job here tonight. Yeah, thank you. You did a great job, Charlie. Do I get a last uh, few last, last, to, do I get last the, remarks? <laughs> you, you, I, I, have the last, I get the last say here. You, you'll get the last say, but wait, oh, wait, wait, right. I <laughs> I get the last rebuttal, then you get the last. Well, what are you going right. to just say? It was a good talk. Yeah, I want to. I, I want to add something here. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, the purpose of regulation, contrary to popular belief, was never to put the government on the backs of people, but to harness the forces of profit and greed to make it work for society instead of against it. Yes. Uh, when when uh, if you look in Russia, for example, when when we went in there and 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 brought in capitalism, so to speak, there was no, there was no regulation. And now you have the court, you have the, you have the oligarchs in Russia controlling everything. And that's part of the problem that you have today. Now in our country, we're leaning, we're leaning in the same direction. We're, we're, we're not allowing corporate, we're, we're not regulating corporations the way we should. Uh, I've been after the oil companies to be regulated in this country down to the, down to a reasonable rate of return, which in turn would cause all other industry that's using oil to, to lower their prices. And also we've lost uh, control on our corporations in the fact that we put a tax on them at 15%, which is fine, but they've taken that and jacked it way up and uh, they're making the consumer pay for that tax is what it amounts to, if you think about it. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, the, the thing's gotten out of control and we need to put it, bring it back in control. We need regulations and we need, and, and the, even Standard Oil, for example, many years ago, they broke them up. Why? Because they were, they were a monopoly and they broke them up and broke them into different corporations. So maybe Monsanto needs to be broken up too. And a few other uh, of the other big, big, big ones that are controlling agriculture that might help in that respect. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up while I'm ahead and give it back to Charlie. And also throw in that I agree with you, Tom, 100%. And I look at regulations as a protection of society That's by right. the government from those greed and the harm to do no harm to the average right. citizen. That's period. Right. I That's agree. their job. Yeah. Charlie, you got the last word. Oh, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And I hope you learned a little something here. Uh, okay, I got four things I'll cover very quickly. If you have cranberries on Thanksgiving, chances are it came from a cranberry bog in Wisconsin, which produces most of the cranberries in the United States. And I particularly am partial to cranberry products. Uh, I like to go up to the state fair and buy any number of select things that even cranberry ice cream and things like that. Anyhow, that's one. Number two, regarding uh, food and nutrition, uh, we know more about the nutritional needs of the picture of the chicken I showed than we do about the nutritional people. needs of a human being. <laughs> they know precisely what that chicken needs to live whatever it is, 16 weeks of its short life. Uh, one other thing regarding food processing, the middlemen again, I showed the list of union made products there uh, for Thanksgiving. You can go find the whole list. If I was singularly amazed when we do a boycott that 
they you boycott not just that they're not one like that list at 10, 10 companies. There are probably only three real companies there. Those are different brand names. Mm -hmm. So there's consolidation and in in those companies themselves. Like we we're doing a boycott against one company. I said, well, how many companies are we boycotting? But they were all one company operating under different labels in different parts of the country. Um, let's see. Uh, last of all, the um, the thing is um, regarding food and animal rights and so forth, I simply say, please try to have nonviolent food is my <laughs> recommendation <laughs> regarding it. Uh, but that's basically it. I had a good time here tonight. Uh, enjoyed myself. And uh, as I say, uh, keep an eye out and happy Thanksgiving, everyone. All right, oh, by the way, let me add one more thing, one more story. This was an amazing story. And this was a company owned by a big Trump supporter. And the government came along during the pandemic. And the beef packing people were ordered back to work. And loads and loads of them came down with, with yeah. COVID and a great many perished. That, those meat packers, they were ordered to provide safety gear. I mean, there were debates about it, gloves and masks mm -hmm. and so forth. They charged the employees out of their paycheck for their safety supplies. Wow. I'm not kidding you. That's capitalism for you. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Hope to They're bastards. It's not capitalism. They're just um, greedy bastards. Okay. Yeah. That one can only hope that karma hits them in a similar fashion down yeah. the road. Period. <laughs> well, since I'm an atheist, <laughs> I'm a, I'm an atheist. Our karma is not religious to me. Oh. I think that. You don't have to be vindictive because when someone has a set character, okay, you don't have to wait, even though they do the dirty on you, you don't have to waste your time and energy in trying to get back at them. I'm not vindictive. I just, they don't exist for me from that point on. But given that character trait, something will visit them one day, you know, in some form because their character is going to invite something rash happening to them down the road well, one can I, only hope i made a big wish that that trump would really just eat more than just eat that last cheeseburger that doesn't <laughs> <laughs> now, i want him the babbling i tell you what for my vision for trump is to be sitting in a very empty mar-a-lago not even having any kind of membership going and no phones ringing, no phone calls returned, and just mumbling to himself, uh, as he does when he makes a speech, actually, to this day, and just having gruel come down the corner of his uh, mouth. And Ivanka definitely will not be visiting because she's already get, done the deep six on him to begin with. She no. ain't. Because her social life has been put in jeopardy by daddy, and she is not even appreciated anywhere she goes. And how Donald Jr. couldn't be there on Tuesday night when he was there on Sunday at a wedding, but all of a sudden had to go hunting on Monday and couldn't get back on Tuesday. Well, the, the sons and daughter are just as disgusting as the father. Oh, they're horrible. Uh, how Jared Kushner even bothered to hang around for that nonsense is Well, he's, he's from the same, you know, he's from Elk. the same Yeah, he's, he's a piece of crap. He's, yeah. a, he's almost a billionaire many hundreds of millions that have been made as a result of him being in this farce of a White House. Yeah. That would that we that almost cost us this country. Okay. And oh, so I really so I not careful. God. Yeah, I I I I'm, I agree with you, but they all have to be stopped. And I think we yeah. have an opportunity now to potentially stop them. One only hopes. We you hope know. So. So, anyhow, happy Thanksgiving, oh, everybody. One last hamburger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what he may have next Thursday, too. Don't, don't forget. Enjoy your um, turkey day, everybody. Enjoy your yeah. family. 
Thank you. You know, and then Thank have you. a happy, Thank happy you. day. Yeah. You betcha. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye yeah, bye. Happy, 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 happy day. I'm Take bye. care. Love. Bye now. Bye. 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 <laughs> I mean, if